Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. This webinar is a presentation of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP, and STAP is a project of the Clean Energy States Alliance. Our topic today is electricity markets and energy storage, and this webinar will be hosted by Todd Olinsky paul who is a project director here at CESA. And before I get started, I would like to go over just a few quick housekeeping notes with everyone. Um, all of our participants today are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options for joining the audio portion of this webinar. You can use your computer, mic, and speakers, or you can call in using your telephone. And there's some instructions for that on your screen and also on your webinar console. Uh, very important note, please submit your questions as you think of them throughout this broadcast. You can do that by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will uh, be reading through your questions as they come in. We'll queue them up and we will answer them as time allows in the Q&A following all of our presentations. So, as I said, please do submit your questions as you think of them and don't wait until the end to type in all of your questions. One final important note for me, this webinar is being recorded, and you will find a recording of this webinar and all of our previous CESA webinars on our website at the address that you see on your screen, cesa.org backslash webinars, and we will also be sending this out to you by email within the next 24 hours. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our host, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd? Hi, thank you very much, Samantha, and welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, this is a webinar uh, production of our STAP project, which is our Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. And we're also, in this webinar, introducing a paper that is a product of uh, Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project, which is uh, CESA and Clean Energy Group are related Nonprofits, and so we're very happy to be able to uh, feature uh, projects from from both of those organizations. Could you advance the slide, please? Uh, I want to uh, thank, first of all, uh, Dr. Emery Zhuk from U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity, and Dan Borneo from Sandia National Laboratories for funding our energy storage uh, program. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background before we introduce the speakers. Um, STAP is a project of CESA. Uh, CESA is Clean Energy States Alliance. You may be familiar as well with the other CESA, which is the California uh, Energy Storage Association. This is a different organization. We uh, are, again, a nonprofit based in Vermont. We work with states all over the country to help them implement effective clean energy policies and programs. And um, the STEP program is conducted under a contract with Sandia National Laboratories with funding from DOE. And STEP focuses specifically on energy storage technologies. And basically we work with uh, states to bring states to the table to partner with DOE and the national laboratories to uh, deploy uh, jointly supported energy storage uh, projects and also to disseminate information through webinars such as this and through other means. Uh, we also support state, state uh, energy storage efforts um, such as resilient power programs that a number of northeastern states have initiated and um, other types of energy storage related programming, um, support for microgrids, support for facility-specific energy storage deployment, um, resiliency programs, and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to let everybody know that if you um, are not on our mailing list and you'd like to get information on future webinars and other uh, you know, reports and so forth, you can go to our website. This is a screenshot. Uh, the arrow on the left, the red arrow, shows you how to access our webinars. They are all archived, and so this webinar will also be archived 
and can be viewed whenever you'd like. And uh, you can also access all of our reports and um, case studies and so forth, blogs. Uh, we send out a monthly free emailed newsletter for our Resilient Power uh, project, and we send out weekly news updates as well for that project. All of the material is free, and, um, and you can sign up for all of it on our website. Next slide, please. So uh, with that said, I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have uh, three speakers. Uh, first up is going to be Seth Mullendore. He's a project manager for Clean Energy Group. He serves as an analyst and technical advisor for power systems, solar PV applications, and battery storage projects. He works with state, municipal, and project developers on outreach and coordination of energy storage project development, and he provides research and reporting of energy storage technologies, policies, and supporting market structures. Prior to joining us here at Clean Energy Group, he served as a Sustainable Energy Fellow with the Union of Concerned Scientists and worked with Maine Clean Communities to help advance clean transportation initiatives in Maine. Seth holds an MS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Stanford University and a BS in Geosciences from the University of Southern Maine. I'd also like to introduce Jay Marhofer. Uh, he is the co-founder, CEO, and inventor of Intelligent Generation. Uh, he has a 35-year business career spanning three disciplines, energy, information technology, and law. He's been a consultant to some of the largest utilities in the United States and is the author of Intelligent Generation, The Smart Way to Build the Smart Grid, and Re-Energizing America, A Common Sense Approach to Energy Independence. Uh, also, we have John Anderson, with us, he's the executive manager of Intelligent Generation as well as a founder and president of Greenleaf Advisors, which advises enterprises on the advancement of sustainable resource issues, including energy. John will be joining us for the question and answer session after the presentations are over. So um, next slide, please. I want to mention a couple of things before we get started with the first presentation. First of all, um, the uh, report that Seth will be introducing in this webinar is uh, addressing energy services markets, such as ancillary services, that can be accessed with uh, solar and storage systems. This is not only an introduction of this uh, report, but is also kicking off a new quarterly series of webinars that we will be debuting in September. And those webinars will be quarterly updates on energy service markets. Uh, and so we're very proud to be able to uh, bring you sort of a, a teaser for that. And um, if you're in interested in what's going on in those markets and what trends look like, um, you know, what upcoming, how upcoming regulatory and legislative changes may affect those markets, then you probably are going to be interested in this quarterly series, which, uh, as I said, is starting in September, and uh, you should sign up for our email list if you want to be notified of those webinars. I also want to mention that we've got a, a large number of people. We have over 200 people at this point uh, participating in this webinar. We will do our best to answer all your questions after the presentations are over. Please don't wait till the end. Send in your questions as we go along. You can type them in on your uh, webinar display. During the presentations, I'll be sorting through those questions and, and doing my best to uh, pick out uh, the, you know, the, the best questions that, that sort of make the most sense, that uh, aren't repetitive and so forth. And so. Um, in order for me to do that, I need to have those questions come in um, as we go and not, not at the end. And having said all that, I would like to turn it over to Seth Mullendore to introduce the report on energy storage and electricity markets. Thanks, Todd, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, joining us today. Yeah, we have a nice big group, um, so great to have you all here. I am going to be uh, talking about a new report that's put out uh, through Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project on energy storage and electricity markets, talking about um, 
the value of storage to the power system and the importance that uh, energy markets have in the in energy storage economics. So just a little um, something about uh, the Resilient Power Project first and Clean Energy Group. Um, so Clean Energy Group is a national nonprofit that works on advancing clean energy finance technology and policy. Uh, the Resilient Power Project is a collaboration between Clean Energy Group and the Meridian Institute and is um, supported by uh, the, the generous funding from uh, JBP Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, and CERTNA Foundation. Resilient Power Project uh, is just coming into its second year now, and its goal is to increase um, investment in clean, resilient power systems. Uh, these are systems that can both provide backup power in case of an emergency and provide other benefits to uh, system owners throughout the year. It has a specific um, focus on low income and vulnerable communities, uh, such as affordable housing, assisted living, and uh, the critical facilities that support those communities. Uh, we work to um, both engage with uh, municipal and, and state officials uh, to help support and advance resilient power policies and programs, and um, also get uh, supportive measures together uh, as far as incentive programs and uh, other support for these projects. We also uh, work to get uh, these projects off uh, off the ground and going, and we have a uh, technical assistance fund that we can help for some of the pre-development costs uh, in these projects, helping support uh, vulnerable communities to get projects going, um, get the initial technical and feasibility scoping going, and uh, get developers together with um, the engineers and get these projects going. So you can see our website, uh, resilient-power.org, uh, for all the work that we've done with this report and additional reports, newsletters, and uh, webinars. All of our past webinars are recorded and available on that website. So um, the reason that we're doing this report as part of the Resilient Power Project is because energy storage um, can not only provide a uh, resiliency benefit when it comes to power outages, uh, so it can be there to provide backup power for critical facilities and help support the life-sustaining um, technologies uh, to keep people to, so they can shelter in place when uh, there's an emergency that strikes. Um, but there's also a factor of economic resiliency that in certain markets, under certain market conditions, energy storage systems can be used to either generate revenue through market participation or lower utility bills, um, such as uh, you know, cost saving and de demand reduction or time shifting of, of power. Uh, the problem is that it can be still difficult to, to get all of these uh, economic factors together in certain markets. And um, as it says here, there's currently no location in the U.S. where the, the full economic full um, valuation of solar can be economically realized uh, under current market conditions. So uh, according to uh, GTM research, the U.S. is expected to deploy more than 200 megawatts of, of energy storage in 2015, but that's only a small fraction of the, the potential that energy storage has. A report that Sandia National Labs did estimated that just for time shifting applications, the it was a potential for, for over 60 gigawatts of energy storage um, that would be beneficial to the power system. So that's the reason why uh, the development of these markets are so important and uh, so important to uh, the projects that are trying to get done that are uh, harnessing energy storage. Um, one of the problems is that, that the benefits, the many benefits that it can provide are split amongst different parties, whether that's utilities, grid operators or, or end users. So it's difficult for any one uh, entity to fully realize the economic value. Um, the other problem is that a lot of the benefits that energy storage can provide, such as resiliency, uh, don't have a market value. So uh, it's difficult to get financing for these when there, there's no proven track record and, and no economic um, market value that you can point to to some of these, these services. Uh, fortunately, there are um, rapidly declining costs in, in technologies and uh, emerging markets that are starting to develop 
around evaluation of uh, energy storage that are starting to make the, uh, the potential um, more economically realizable. So the report goes over some of these markets and situations where energy storage is starting to show a, a viable economic return without subsidies. Um, uh, some of these, the ones that I'm going to touch on today, are the uh, ancillary services market as well as demand response programs and additional customer savings um, values in demand management and timing of use, energy shifting. So first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, markets in general and why these electricity and energy markets exist. So first thing is electricity is a commodity, just like any other resource. Uh, it may not seem like it sometimes. It's, uh, you know, it's quite different in, in some respects. And uh, one of the things that's so different is that there's very little capacity to store energy on the power system. Um, the amount of uh, generation supply that's out there versus the amount that can be stored, it's a very um, small fraction of the total that can be uh, stored at this point. So that uh, there must be a balance um, between supply and demand at all times. Um, it's also limited by, you know, the amount of generation supply that is out there um, so that these peak demand situations are, are limited by the amount of generation there is. Um, and that balance that I was talking about is the, the frequency range that um, electricity must be delivered in. It has to be about 60 hertz um, within a very narrow margin of that uh, if there's, you know, say, too much generation in the system that can lead to too high of a frequency. If there's too little generation to meet demand, that can be uh, too low frequency. And historically, the, these um, balancing has been done by fossil fuel generators ramping up and down, which uh, which can work, but it, it's pretty inefficient and expensive way to do it. Um, so these constraints, the, the available generation supply and the frequency range, as well as a number of other restraints, has led to the creation of these electricity markets where um, there's different valuations for different services that uh, need to be supplied on, on the energy market. Um, another important thing to, to note when we're talking about energy markets is a basic structure of uh, how these markets are structured. There's, there's really two different kinds of uh, regional electricity market structures. There's traditional markets, which um, tend to be the, um, uh, the tra tra traditional markets are the um, areas not colored in, uh, on this map. And those are where the transmission system, the generation, basically any, everything involved in electricity, transmission, generation, is all under the control of utilities, um, and they pretty much control it end-to-end. -end. Uh, the other side is the colored areas on this map, which are um, regional transmission operators, the independent system on operators and regional transmission organizations. And under these structures, the uh, transmission side of things is uh, governed by an entity that is not the utilities. Um, so these tend to be more open and competitive, and these are really the markets that uh, the most is happening in energy storage is, is playing a bigger role. Um, it's also good to note that um, because electricity uh, tends to frequently cross state lines due to the regional nature of these markets, is it's subject to regulation by the um, Federal Regulatory Energy Commission, or FERC. And uh, a number of the um, FERC-mandated orders uh, have been uh, used to, when they've been implemented and uh, have allowed energy storage to play a larger role in these electricity markets that have been traditionally dominated by fossil fuel resources. So the first of these markets that I'd like to talk about is ancillary services. And this covers a wide range of um, basically transmission distribution aided services. Um, Frequency regulation is the, the balancing I talked about, and then there's spinning and on spinning reserves. That's um, generation capacity uh, that can be brought online to, to meet um, certain demand needs. Uh, voltage control, which is similar to frequency regulation, but um, maintains proper transmission system on the, the, the voltage of the transmission system. And black star capabilities, which is the ability to restore power to part of the grid when there's an outage. Uh, energy storage can provide all of these services. Um, but right now, it uh, is really only playing a large role in the frequency regulation market. 
Um, and even that wasn't the case until uh, fairly recently. Uh, there was a FERC order, FERC order 755, that uh, mandated that in the frequency regulation market, um, the, the ISOs, the operators, had to take account for the speed and accuracy of response to calls for frequency regulation in their compensation mechanisms. This was a, a big deal for storage because energy storage, um, mainly batteries and, and flywheels, can respond very quickly to calls for regulation up or regulation down and are, are well suited to providing these services. Um, in fact, there, there was a study done by uh, the Pacific Northwest National Lab that uh, found that batteries and flywheels could be up to 17 times more effective than fossil fuels in, in this regulation. Um, and PNJ has actually found that with the introduction of more fast response resources, their needs for frequency regulation capacity have been reduced. Um, so this FERC Order 755 and, and also uh, 784 kind of expand on that order um, it's been implemented in a number of the major uh, ISO markets, uh, PJM, um, the, the Midwest ISO, MISO, uh, New York, California, uh, and New England, and uh, ERCOT, the Texas market, is also thinking of implementing a similar methodology. Um, but it, it still remains that uh, PJM is the only market where energy storage is currently playing a, a major significant role in the frequency regulation market. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, it has to do with the way that FERC Order 755 was implemented by PJM. Um, FERC mandates certain recommendations, but does not mandate how they're implemented. And so different markets have implement them in different ways. So, so part of the, the reason is that they have this two-part mechanism for uh, compensation. One is the magnitude of frequency regulation, so how much regulation a resource offers. And the other is performance, which is what I talked about with the speed and accuracy. So um, resources that are more accurate and have a, a quicker reaction time get compensated at a higher level. Uh, the second of these is, is the effective megawatt compensation, which uh, basically means that regulation capacities that have a, a higher historic performance and incremental benefit are um, compensated at a higher level. So if a resource uh, has historically had a, a higher level of um, response time and response accuracy, then it is um, – compensated at a higher rate for its capacity. Uh, another change that they had uh, is different than some of the other markets is it's a five-minute interval lost opportunity cost. So in this case, the lost opportunity cost is acting as a uh, in the wholesale capacity, electricity capacity market. So by moving to a five-minute interval from, uh, say, a, a larger time interval, uh, their valuation of this lost opportunity cost is, is able to capture the true market fluctuations um, that can be uh, on a shorter time scale, which can have you know a, a big up and down depending on what the capacity market is looking like at the time and how stressed uh, the system is. Uh, another portion is the mileage compensation, which um, again, so there there are two types of um, resource for frequency regulation. There's the traditional, which is it's generally like fossil fuel. This is the what PJM calls their Reg A, and it's fast response, which is their Reg D. That's energy storage and similar resources. And uh, PJM found that they, they call on the Reg D, the fast response, about three times uh, more often than Reg A, and, and they reported. Um, and so because of that, they're, since these resources are utilized more often, uh, they receive a higher compensation. Uh, another couple of things that, that make this market more accessible is the, uh, the participation threshold for participating in the market is 100 kilowatts. Uh, that's, uh, you know, in comparison to, say, New York ISO or, or the New England ISO, uh, their competition threshold is, is 10 times higher at 1 megawatt. Um, for the Midwest, it's, it's 5 megawatts. Um, and not only that, uh, PJM also allows for resource aggregation so that uh, a number of smaller resources, say you had... 10, 10 kilowatt resources to um, uh, for the frequency regulation market. They wouldn't be able to participate alone, but aggregated together, uh, they could reach that 100 kilowatt 
participation threshold and participate in the market. And those can be located, you know, throughout the PJM territory. They don't have to be located at one facility. So that's why uh, PJM ha has uh, shown itself as a great market for energy storage resources. Uh, just want to point out, too, that um, developers have found that, that uh, because of these rules that uh, – Project pay to MAC times have been reduced to, to as little as just a few years for these energy storage projects. And, in fact, um, uh, it's been such a successful market that in 2014, about two-thirds of the energy storage that was deployed was actually deployed in the PJM territory. And that, this remains the biggest market and really the biggest opportunity right now for energy storage. Although it should be noted that um, frequency regulation markets are small compared to um, wholesale electricity capacity markets which um, they're about 1% of the peak demand. Um, so there is a potential that these markets could become saturated. Uh, and, and actually recently heard that uh, PGM may be proposing a cap on their fast response resources, but I'm, we're not sure how that's going to play out just yet. Um, the reality, too, is that um, higher levels of renewable penetration may result in uh, an increase in the size of the, the frequency regulation market. There may be more need for these resources as more – uh, variable resources come online. So another emerging market that I want to talk about is, is demand response programs. These are generally uh, utility programs that are um, put in place to meet peak demand needs of um, utilities serving their customers. Uh, so these are particularly important on days, say, you know, a high heat day when a lot of customers are running their air conditioners or a very cold day. Um, in certain markets where there's a lot of electric heating. Uh, so these are a demand-side resource, which is um, different than the supply side that utilities normally deal with. And uh, it's often been served by large companies or industries that have a huge demand uh, that can dial back what they're doing um, certain, during certain periods to um, decrease their load on the system. Energy storage can also provide these needs by uh, meeting – the demands of local loads, uh, energy storage can take away some of the grid demand and um, supply it through stored energy, which does the same thing. It lowers the, the system peak demand that utilities are, are, are trying to, to decrease, uh, either because of capacity strengths or to uh, avoid um, utilizing peaker plants, which are, are generally natural gas plants that um, – the energy from these peaking plants tends to be, be very expensive and, and they're rather inefficient to run. Um, also, uh, with more demand side resources, utilities can, can certainly delay new generation capacity and, and sometimes they, they can even avoid the need to add new generation capacity. Um, energy storage has, has played a, a successful part in uh, these demand response programs in uh, New York City with the Con Edison program as well as a couple of um, large pilot programs in California. In fact, um, STEM is looking at doing 85 megawatts of the, the behind-the-meter resources in Southern California um, as part of their uh, acquisition for the energy storage mandate. And Hawaii has also been exploring the, the value of energy storage in, in these demand side, uh, demand response resources. Um, Demand response has also been partially enabled through uh, FERC orders. There's FERC order 745, which uh, stated that demand response resources uh, should see, receive the same level of compensation as traditional generation in the uh, wholesale electricity markets. Uh, now, this has been challenged, and uh, it's currently awaiting a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, but um, demand response is, is expected to continue to be an important resource for utilities going forward. I'm also going to touch briefly on the, the customer savings side, energy storage, which is being utilized to reduce customer bills. Um, these aren't markets per se, but they're still an area where energy storage is playing a role under certain rate conditions. Um, one of the big ones that, that people talk about the most probably and you hear the most about is demand management. Uh, it's basically shown in this graph here, this graph here where um, demand can peak throughout the day, um, and certain customers face demand charges. These are typically applied to commercial rates only, although more and more um, utilities are starting to talk about these for residential customers as well as a way to pay for some of the fixed costs that, that the system has, uh, particularly in areas where we're starting to see more and more um, 
solar deployment. So um, demand uh, charges is priced as the uh, the highest level of demand that a facility uses over any specific interval, uh, usually 15 minutes throughout uh, a month or a billion period, which is generally a month. So by using energy storage, you can meet part of that demand and, and basically uh, cap the highest threshold of the demand you have at a specified point by cutting off those peaks. The, the, the parts shown in red on the graph are those, those peaks that would be there if it wasn't energy storage, but at those times, energy storage would be discharging to meet that demand, so it's basically capped off. Uh, here you see it's a reduction from 100 kilowatts during the period down to 65 kilowatts. So that 35 kilowatt reduction uh, can result in a savings for the end user. You, know, you see a couple of scenarios here at 10 kilowatt, um, uh, $10 per kilowatt demand charge, you'd see over $4,000 annual savings, $20 per kilowatt, which is um, a rate that's seen often in, in like New York City and in California, as well as some other markets around the U.S., that you're up over $8,000 in annual savings. Uh, the, the other um, area that customers are using energy storage to reduce their energy costs is in uh, energy time shifting, and this is for customers that are on time of use rates. So basically, customers can charge the battery uh, either through solar or um, during off-peak hours when energy prices are cheaper, and then discharge that energy um, when they're using energy during the peak times when electricity costs can be quite a bit more expensive. Um, this also acts to lower the, the peak demand levels for the utility as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of an all-around win for both utilities and customers. So there's a lot more value that storage can add to the system. Uh, this is just kind of a, a graphic here showing some of the many benefits that it can provide in general. Um, you know, it can help with grid congestion relief um, for overloaded transmission lines. Uh, it can help um, defer transmission and distribution upgrades. It can also aid in renewables generation by being a flexible capacity. Some utilities or um, some grid operators are looking at developing a market for flexible resources, which energy storage would certainly play a major role in. And also is a, is a big part of the project, the Resilient Power Project, is power resiliency, which again has no specific market value, but can be of, of great importance to the end user, especially cases when you're talking about a hospital or uh, a senior living center where people have a difficult time um, leaving their, the, the building during an emergency situation in particular. And in places where we found uh, high levels of, of failure rates in diesel generators. So that's, uh, that's all I have. Um, you know, our, the report is available online on our website if you'd like to learn more. Um, here's my contact information and, and a few of our websites, so you can check out Clean Energy Group and the Resilient Power Project. And now I'm going to turn things over to Intelligent Generation and Jay Marhofer. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, we are going to, as you said, turn it over to Jer Jay Marhofer of Intelligent Generation. Um, and just for those of you who are sending in questions, thanks for sending them. We, we will get to the, as many as we can after Jay's presentation. Um, so con continue sending the questions in. Jay? Thank you. And... Um Good afternoon to those of you in the eastern half of the United States, and good morning to those of you in the western half of the United States. Um, I'm going to pick up really where Seth left off, because I think Seth gave an excellent overview of sort of the individual markets and benefit streams available uh, with energy storage. And the question becomes at that point, you know, what happens when you roll that up at a macro level? into this kind of new phenomenon where you do see hundreds of megawatts coming online, uh, you, and not only in the form of stationary, but, you know, in the form of electric vehicles as well. What does that look like and what is required uh, to do that? So we're going to expand this discussion of the market to talk a little bit more about how do you manage it and how do you monetize it across these multiple streams. And that's what Intelligent Generation as a software company is, is really – a developer of a platform or operating system for this network clean energy grid. 
So about us, we've been uh, around since 2009, and we believe, as our founding principle, that we can create a world of sustainable abundance is powered by clean energy. But to do that, we have to provide the economic empowerment for end users to want to install it. We have to make uh, renewables, electric vehicles, et cetera, pass the pencil test. And we believe the way to do that is through an intelligent network. And that's what we're in the business to do, to provide the operating system for this intelligent network of distributed clean energy, including storage. And we work with partners with PJM uh, really since the early days of, uh, of the uh, fast response regulation market, uh, ComEd, we're based in Chicago. Our two pilot customers have uh, been up and going now for, in the case of S&C Electric, over a year in Continental. So that's really the first creation of the network and others. Now, when we talk about it, what is the uh, operating system, we, and, and when it comes to energy storage, we think of this really as a three-dimensional model. And those dimensions are the asset class, so what is the type of storage we're looking at? Utility-sided, customer-sided, stationary, mobile. Um, what are the markets? And the markets obviously can be in the RTOs, but as we've seen with the recent uh, notice of proposed rulemaking from FERC, frequency response is now something that is going to go to states that are not part of RTOs. And then what are the applications, the various benefit streams on both the retail side and the wholesale side, and let's say the customer side as well. And so that's where we start. Well, when we think about asset classes, let's just kind of deal with two electric vehicles and stationary storage, uh, typically uh, grid tied with solar projects. The reason we bring up electric vehicles is, is this is a force that cannot be ignored because if you think of 10,000 Teslas, and right now they're selling 30 or 40,000 a year, 10,000 Teslas, if they plugged in at the same time, would be the equivalent of taking a small nuclear power plant offline immediately. And this is all something that would occur really rather invisibly to the utility and certainly the RTO like PJM. Now, that in itself, I think, is impressive. But if you look at what the trend is for both, uh, you know, private passenger and commercial electric vehicles in the years to come, uh, it is expected that sometime around 2040, uh, if not a little earlier, maybe around 2035, that the combined capacity of these vehicles is going to be about a terawatt of electricity. And by way of comparison right now, the entire peak demand of the entire country uh, at a given point was 800 gigawatts, so 0.8 terawatts. So very soon electric vehicles, and not too distant future, because we're as close to that point as we are at the beginning of the, of the, of the millennium, uh, very soon you're going to have an electric vehicle fleet that essentially has the entire capacity of the U.S. power grid as it stands today. And by the same token, we're going to see intermittent forms of generation um, take an ever-increasing share, particularly as solar prices continue to decline, so that, uh, you know, at some point, we think in the next 20 years or so, that renewables are like, and especially with things like the clean power plan, Renewables are going to be a share of electricity that's 30, 40 percent. Now, obviously, renewable has the, renewables like solar and wind have the advantage of being clean and having a free energy source after the capital cost, uh, but they are intermittent. Uh, the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, production goes down. And that's obviously where storage comes into play because storage acts as both a shock absorber for the grid in terms of balancing load and uh, supply, and also the fulcrum for the grid in terms of being able to charge during uh, basically valleys in demand and discharge during peaks in demand. Now, as we know, there are, and as Seth, is, as Seth has said, there are um, a number of different applications, but obviously the fundamental truth of the electricity market is that it has to be built for maximum capacity, um, which inherently creates inefficiencies. So you have about 1.2 gigawatts of installed capacity, I'm sorry, 1.2 terawatts of installed capacity in the United States, but the average demand is somewhere around 500 to 600 gigawatts at a given point. So what do you do with that, and especially as the uh, number or percentage of intermittent clean sources of electricity like solar and wind uh, become become a greater part of that. 
you know, how do you sort of flatten out the peaks, which is obviously a way to improve utilization and efficiency in the system. And we see this occurring now in states like California and certainly Hawaii, where there is, and, and obviously Germany is sort of leading the pack with this, where you have the sort of inherent, um, you know, conundrum, if you will, of what happens when you have a significant uh, a significant percentage of installed solar capacity. Because as we know, solar tends to track daily demand pretty well. Um, you know, it lags it by about three hours. So, you know, solar noon, depending on whether you're on daylight savings time, the peak of solar output is either, is either noon or 1 p.m. Peak demand, though, it tends to occur around 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, at which point solar is dropping off. And so you're going to have somewhat of an overabundance of solar in the early afternoon hours and not quite enough of it in the later hours. And the more solar capacity you install, the bigger that dip between solar production and actual demand that goes on. And we've seen that in the United States, in Hawaii, and in cities like San Diego, that when, that when installed solar is more than 5% of total generation capacity, um, you get these sort of fluctuations that, you know, can be problematic for grid operators. Uh, obviously, in Germany, you know, where storage, I think, is something where they have kind of leading the way in a lot of ways, too, uh, it's a problem as well. Obviously, this is also true on a seasonal basis because solar, although it tracks um, daily demand fairly well, it's kind of shifted off by about a season. So obviously the peak solar output of the year is on the uh, is in the summer equinox in June, but peak demand occurs in late July and early August when demand is starting to increase. And obviously you build solar capacity, its peak demand, you know, relative to supply tends to be in April and September, very temperate months when a lot of net metering is going to occur because overall load is low but but output is high. So storage becomes a play in terms of how you handle that, in terms of these applications. So if you think about those two asset classes, and I think of this really as solar plus storage, and I think about electric vehicles, the second dimension then turns to the markets. And as Seth has, as Seth has talked about, uh, we have first of all the sort of monetary markets and the regional transmission organizations uh, in the United States and Canada. But we also have a, a bunch of other states that have, you know, their own sort of individual, individual grids. And, of course, the RTO market map um, is not something necessarily tied to the physical transmission map. So you have CERC and you have, you know, the southern regional transmission things. You've got the western interconnect. You've got things like that. that don't necessarily show up, but it does definitely uh, indicate the transmission of electricity across as a matter of interstate commerce and that thing. And so what's interesting about the markets is that if you're going to basically have an operating system that plays in different markets, you have to recognize the tapestry of different rules uh, within a market within a state. Obviously, the first rule is federal versus state. So FERC has its order, 745755, you know, the frequency response rule that's in rulemaking right now. The State Public Utility Commission, where everything is rate case, have their own set of rules. And this comes down to, you know, how this looks in terms of the uh, deregulated utilities, um, where they're just wires and meters, and you've got uh, third-party ownership of generation assets, versus vertically integrated states. You think of states like Florida, for example, where there really is it's a very tightly controlled market, not part of an RTO. You think about this in terms of the investor-owned utility versus munis municipalities or co-ops, which create their own sets of rules and have, may have different sets of uh, jurisdiction under the Public Utility Commission of the state. And then, of course, when you look at storage, there are different rules related to behind the meter where, you know, as long as the storage asset and the renewables are just providing for the load, even the minimum load of the building, there's really very little regulation other than interconnection agreement that's required. If you have a utility-sided interconnect, uh, there are different rules for that. And sometimes in the case of PJM, for example, uh, those rules differ by size of the asset. And so if you're going to have something that looks at the aggregation 
of electric vehicles. Think of commercial fleets that are all uh, charging at 6 p.m. but could all play in the frequency regulation market at that time. You know, think of solar plus storage and how you might combine those two assets to play in something like spinning reserves. You've got to know the rules. You've got to know the rules for the RTO and for the state uh, and for the utility uh, or the jurisdiction in which you're playing. Uh, and that's, if you know these rules, knowledge is power, and that is a way to monetize this across different applications. So as Seth was mentioning as well, and I'll reiterate, there are a variety of different applications um, for which um, storage can provide value. And obviously the goal with storage, given that I, we've reached a point in the five years since intelligent generation has been around, where we've crossed you know, the point where people look at lithium-ion batteries as a source of fires to something where you've got vendors giving a 10-year warranty with a performance wrap. And these are well-capitalized vendors uh, who are standing behind their products. You have solved the, tech, the project risk where companies like ours have been playing in the PJM frequency regulation market now for close to a year. And so all that's left is the, uh, the economics which is the last hurdle right now. The reason economics remains a hurdle is because, uh, going back to Seth's presentation, there are two primary drivers of value um, that people try to use to justify the investment in a storage asset with a 10-year warranty. One is frequency regulation uh, in PJM, for example, but there are two major problems with that. The first is that, of course, even though regulation is a spot market, 365 days a year, uh, 27 or 24 hours a day, um, it's all merchant risk. There are no forward contracts for frequency regulation, whereas the norm in electricity is that for energy, you'll probably have a three-year supply contract, and for capacity, you have a three-year forward market too. Nothing similar exists for regulation right now, and thus investments, um, there's not much of a guarantee you can give a, pr a prospective project finance year can't say, well, the average price has been in the high 30s, low 40s for the last 18 months because as more batteries come online, what do you do at that point? The other major benefit has been on the retail side, and that's been uh, demand charge management. Uh, so companies like STEM, obviously, have, have made a good business of that. But there, too, you're limited because you need two things to be true there. The first is you have to be in a jurisdiction that has high demand charge rates. So you have California, you've got New York, but it pretty much has to be above $15 a kilowatt. And the second is you have to be uh, working with a client subset that has predictable, repeatable, and pronounced spikes in demand. Um, because the issue with demand charge management is that all it takes is missing one peak uh, for one 15 or 30 minute interval in a month and he spent a lot of time discharging, charging that battery and, and, you know, using some of its cycles, its spreadable cycles, for no benefit. So you got to be careful with that. So we look at this at Intelligent Generation as a value hierarchy, as a value stack that says, depending on the battery, depending on the market, depending on the application, we might be able to use that battery for three or four different things. And so what we've done is take a look at using the battery to, first of all, provide a retail benefit. So the best thing that comes to mind at PJM is line item capacity charge reduction. We know what the rate's going to be for three years. It's based on peak load contribution. It's either the highest five or highest ten hours on different days during the course of uh, the summer. And you have a pretty good idea of when those periods are going to be. So you don't have to use a lot of the battery. Um, to basically lower that rate. Um, and so there's not a lot, of, a lot of wear and tear on the battery, but the, the value is equivalent to 2 or $3 a kilowatt hour, uh, which is a lot better than the 6 or $0.07 cent per kilowatt hour retail rate. So retail capacity reduction is one use. Um, in certain cases, demand charge reduction might be the case, but you have to have the high kilowatt rate to do that. And then if you're not looking at summer months, you do have the wholesale plays of regulation, although that is a thin market, so it's important to look beyond regulation. And now you've got other ancillary services, perhaps like uh, synchronous or spinning reserve, 
which has a nice correlation in terms of uh, value, even though it's probably got it's, it's three or four times the size of the regulation market, but only comes into play about 10% of the time. That's still a nice adder to have there. In certain states, in certain RTOs, you may not have a capacity market. Uh, think of ERCOT as an example, or think of MISO. But you might have the opportunity for arbitrage, because in Texas, as an example, you may see swings that are 30 or 40 cents a kilowatt hour based on the amount of wind capacity that's online. So our whole notion in terms of the operating system is to say, if we look at the type of asset and its use and its highest and best use, whether it's mobile or whether it's stationary, if we look at the market in which it exists, the rules of the RTO, the rules of the utility, the rate structure, the customer type, and we look at the applications that can be monetized, then an operating system can look at this network of assets and provide the benefit for the uh, retail side when it's the highest and best use of the storage, but aggregate it as something that provides benefit or revenue on the wholesale side when that's a higher or best use of the asset. So as we say, you know, we've been playing the frequency regulation market for about a year, and as Seth has said, batteries do it very well. Um, we at Intelligent Generation have about, you know, a 95-plus percent performance score in terms of tracking the PJM signal. Um, and, you know, the average clearing price is $40. But we're moving beyond putting all of our eggs in the FR basket because, you know, as I said, it's got those two problems, even though I think we're close to getting over that financial hurdle in terms of, you know, some innovative ways of uh, basically securitizing that risk. But we have to look at the other benefit streams to make that work. So when we look at the various types of things we can do and how we've done this, again, it comes down to our whole philosophy, which is let's take advantage of everything we can to make storage economic. Obviously, one thing to do is to co-locate it with solar because in the right combination, uh, the storage asset qualifies for the 30% investment tax credit. 30% off the capital cost, um, that's a pretty good thing. Um, we look at things like, as we said, solar fleet and then grid, which is grid-sided storage, um, and that's the way to optimize the economics. Uh, as an example, you know, when we look at grouping it with solar, um, we have the motto of earn, save, protect, so we can earn back uh, significant things in the in the in the power markets like regulation or uh, reserves, um, spending reserve. We can shave the retail rate because the PV is going to reduce that rate with its um, with the amount of energy that it's duplicating, and it's got 20 year 25 year life for the panels. But there may be other savings possible as well, such as peak load contribution reduction on the bill. And then for the commercial, the CNI customer, um, obviously you have backup power that can provide for life and safety um, backup and, you know, business interruption types of things. And one way to monetize that perhaps is the difference in insurance costs for business interruption insurance. So this just provides a look at the various types of applications, fleet, solar, reserve, and grid. So just to summarize, uh, and then I can go mute for a while, obviously, you know, solar plus storage and EVs are emerging today, but in 10 years, they're going to be quite seismic in terms of their effect. If you look at those trend lines and the amount of capacity that that storage is going to be in terms of the need to charge, discharge, and be managed um, as part of the overall grid. Um, the market will continue to evolve and drive management, uh, control, and monetization. So as we look, look at certain things related to the retail and wholesale sides, such, such emerging uh, benefit streams like solar firming or wind parking are going to at some point be able to, be, to have dollar values assigned to the value that that's provided. The trick is to make sure that we can seize and take advantage of the economics today because it only gets better um, as the years go on. 
And obviously what we're looking to do is to provide a platform among these three dimensions, different asset classes, different markets, and different applications. And with that, uh, I look forward, and, and John Anderson, our executive manager, look forward to answering your questions. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Jay. Um, that was, those were both excellent presentations. We do have a number of questions queued up, and uh, folks could uh, certainly send in more questions if, you, if you're just thinking of them now. Um, we will start with a question that's uh, directed to Seth. Could you explain what you mean by opportunity cost and mileage? And this is... Um, I assume with regard to the Reg D uh, uh, signal in PJM. Actually, I think I might defer to Jay on this because um, since you guys deal directly in that market, you might have a, a better way to, to describe this for people. Um, Jay, you want to take that? Yeah. So um, I'm sorry. It was mileage, and what was the other? What was the other component? Hey, opportunity cost. So the opportunity cost um, is something that really does not apply to batteries. It typically applies to generators. And what happens with the opportunity cost in PJM is given its history of regulation being provided by fossil fuel plants and by ramping up or ramp, ramping down utilization. So let's say you're going at 90% and they need more power, you go up to 92%, and you go down, you need less power, you go down to 88%. The opportunity cost is saying, all right, if there's if if it's going to if it if you're going to get less benefit uh, from the regulation market this hour than you would than you would have gotten providing into the energy market with that generator, we're going to pay you for that. Now, batteries are not generators, so devices don't get opportunity costs, um, and it starts to get a little bit more complicated. That, but we'll just leave it at that. So, the opportunity cost or lost opportunity cost is focused on synchronous generators, really not batteries. Mileage is based on the fact that the slow signal and the fast signal are very different. So the slow signal tend, tends to be more of sort of a saw wave, if you will, without a lot of variation, uh, because a generator would get up to 10 minutes to respond. There's a lot of inertia in the system, and that's why they were able to do it. The, uh, the fast response signal, though, is a really a bouncing ball. I mean, that thing, because if you, let's say, have a megawatt that you've bit into the system, that signal could be anywhere from minus 100, uh, minus 1 megawatt in terms of saying, okay, we need you to add a megawatt of load, which means charge the battery full, um, to a positive megawatt, which means, okay, we need some power, so discharge that full, and any point in between those two, and that signal goes from one extreme to the other. Uh, and at all points in between. So if you were to take that, if you were to take that uh, sort of sinusoidal thing that bounces over the place and straighten it out in terms of that signal, that's the mileage, and that's the added value that storage provides because a, a slow response fossil fuel plant can't respond to that, um, but a battery can, and thus there's a premium paid for its ability to do that. Okay, thank you. I, I, but with regard to the <clears throat> the mileage question, I believe in the report <clears throat> that we're that that Seth introduced um, in this webinar, we have a a pretty good description of of what mileage means in this in this context. So um, maybe Samantha, if we could get a uh, a URL up on the screen so that people can see where to download the report. That might be helpful. Uh, next question, are there any projects currently in the PJM market doing voltage support? Does anybody know? If you're talking about, well, it, I know it's tough to ask for clarification because you're sending it. So, um, Batteries are in part of the PJM interconnect do not have to provide reactive power, but they can, if that's what we're talking about for voltage support. Um, so there are certainly projects in our pipeline where that is contemplated. Uh, again, the value for that is undetermined, um, but uh, I, I guess the answer to that is uh, is yes. Okay. 
Good, thank you. And I see that we, we do now have the report up on the screen with the link. Uh, so if you'd like to download that, uh, that's the that's the link to do so. Uh, next question regards the uh, bilateral market states where there's not an organized market as we saw in the map. There's a considerable part of the country where you don't have an RTO or an ISO. Um, in those areas, uh, the questioner wants to know, are there any suggestions for making the economic case for storage in that environment? Uh, can we even speak to that as a monolithic thing, or, or does it depend on specifically where you are? Seth, you can take a crack at that, or I'm happy to do it as well. <laughs> well, um, uh, well, we can both take a crack at it. Um, I mean, I would say that it, it really is highly dependent on, on where you're talking about. Um, you know, these uh, you don't tend to have these market opportunities as much there. As Jay mentioned, though, the uh, FERC has mandated that the uh, the frequency regulation uh, market, the, the rules on that that they've put forward, does uh, need to be expanded to uh, all the markets, whether it's it's within the the uh, the regulated or deregulated or the the regional markets or not, and. and you know, in addition, you still have um, a lot of utilities in, throughout the U.S. that are looking at doing demand response programs that are starting to incorporate uh, energy storage. I, I recently saw that there was a utility in uh, Louisiana that's going to be doing a demand response program for storage where they're providing the systems for free. So there are opportunities um, in the, uh, you know, the, the, the top-down utility markets as well. Um, it just really depends on, on what's what's out there and, and where you're, you're located. Um, Jay? Well, what I would add to that is is, is, I'll, is, is I concur in, in what Seth has said. And it really, I think, comes down to this, and, and it's going to evolve uh, as time goes on. So uh, the first is, you know, in a vertically integrated state, I'm, and I live in Florida, so that's as good an example of one as you're going to find, you know, how much excess generation capacity do the utilities own right now? Because, you know, the more they have and the more that's unused, um, the less opportunity there is for third parties to come in and offer the services at, com at competitive economic prices. All of that said, it'll be interesting to see how the clean power plan rolls out because the more, uh, you know, in PJM they're retiring, you know, 13 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity over the next few years. Um, and so the more coal-fired plants come th that are being retired, the greater the opportunity. The other thing I think you will see happening is once natural gas prices, um, you know, have been upward, upward cycle in price, that drives, uh, that drives, you know, the value of these things or alternatives as much as anything else. Okay, great. Uh, I, you know, the, I want to queue up this next question. Uh, you know, it has to do with the value stacking that um, we've talked about and everybody talks about with regard to these uh, solar and storage systems um, as being really necessary in, in not not every market, but in many markets, probably most markets, uh, you need to do more than than one thing with you know, a couple of notable exceptions in order to make the the uh, system make economic sense. And uh, yeah, actually this is something that um, if anyone saw Jigger Shaw's uh, comments at a recent uh, Energy Storage Association uh, uh, conference where he, he said, you know, you tell me your battery can do 10 things, but it's really only good at three of them. So th that's just to, to cue up the question because I think it's a it's an important question that, um, you know, is, is sort of critical to, to um, the economics of these systems. The questioner says, per IG's comments, I've heard from battery companies that it is very difficult to monetize batteries through all the applications IG mentions simultaneously. The battery's chemical composition essentially doesn't allow for it, and if you use the battery for all purposes, you'd lower its useful life considerably. Do they disagree? So there's the, the question really is um, how flexible are the current batteries on the market to do multiple tasks without um, harming the 
the the life expectancy of the battery. You know, is that changing? Uh, and can we get around that with either uh, controls or aggregation or hybrid systems? And you know, what what is the situation with that? So that, that, that that's absolutely true, um, and it's certainly something that we have in mind, and that's and that's why we see the network as being something of significant value here. I mean, the physics, particularly of lithium-ion batteries, are such that you can have a cell structure that is uh, power-focused, which plays well for regulation, but will not play for capacity or arbitrage. You can have something that is energy-focused, which will play well for capacity, arbitrage, backup power, but not play in regulation. Or what we or what we do is we take a look at what is the right sizing in terms of putting it somewhere in the middle that says, you know, this will work well for regulation done this many cycles because regulation is a very shallow cycle application. But for the few times a year, and that's the key thing here, the few times a year that you're going to use the battery and deep discharge it for capacity, you know, PLC reduction and that type of thing, there's a whole calculus that goes into determining the C factor of the battery and the monetary applications of doing it. And we, we, we understand all that. Believe me, we've been looking at that for a while. Now, what we do on top of that is, you know, if you do that with one battery, a uh, different story. If you have a network of megawatts of batteries ranging in size from, you know, uh, uh, commercial truck batteries, 100 kilowatts, to a CNI batteries, 100 kilowatts, to municipalities where we have five megawatts and that type of thing. But we have an idea of balancing algorithms, which maximize the efficiency and the use of batteries. So, as an example, let's say we've got let's say we've got 10 megawatts playing in regulation, but we're not doing that with one 10 megawatt battery. We've got we've got a bunch of building blocks with that. So, when the reg signal is four megawatts, we're going to be using you know a subset at 100% efficiency rather than everything at 40% efficiency. So by doing it that way for regulation, for reserve, uh, perhaps for wholesale capacity at some point, uh, that prolongs battery life, it improves efficiency, and that exemplifies the value of a network. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, we have a question on the residential storage market. Uh, the questioner wants to know whether you have any data on the size of the residential storage market or how many utilities are actively exploring residential storage projects. Uh, I should mention I, we, we know of uh, a few utilities that are uh, exploring the idea of um, uh, distributed storage, including residential systems that would either be owned by the customer and then used uh, accessed and used by the utility under contract or you, or owned by the utility um, but placed on the customer's property. So that's certainly an issue that's, that's um, you know, getting some attention right now from a few utilities. Do you guys have any sense of the size of the residential market for storage and, and uh, any more information about the idea of utilities exploring those markets? I mean, I don't, I don't have any market size data. As you mentioned, you know, I keep seeing more and more utilities that are looking into um, providing these systems to, to residential customers uh, in order to, to balance their, their peak loads as a way to offset their, um, their contribution to the, the regional peak load uh, throughout the year, which is a, it's a big expense for utilities to, to pay. Um, I also know of a, um, a project that is close to completion in that is located in Maryland that is um, uh, 20 or 25 residential systems that are being aggregated together to participate in the frequency regulation market. Um, so there's a potential there as well. Basically, on, on the residential side, it seems like uh, as far as making an economic case for things that there's it's really on the aggregation side to participate in demand response or frequency regulation or what what have you or for these um, utility programs there is the argument again for you know increased self consumption or backup power but at this time it does seem like uh, the systems 
aren't particularly economic on the residential scale for, for those kinds of applications. Thanks. Uh, Jay and John, do you, you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I, it, it's the only, the only way it makes sense um, because the unit cost for a residential system is much higher than it is for um, a CNI system or a municipality. Um, is I think that there is a possibility down the road for either um, uh, new residential construction where solar plus storage is seen as a, as a standard um, feature and not having it as an upgrade <laughs> to the home buyer in that case. Because obviously the per unit cost when it's not a retrofit, when it's actually built into the initial build, is going to be much less. Um, I think the other possibility, though, would be in the government sector, uh, in DOD as an example, where you might have uh, retrofits of, you know, existing uh, military housing, and, and it's all based on the standard configuration. Uh, again, the only way it makes sense is it's, not, it's never going to work on the custom one-off basis, uh, the custom home one-off basis. But if you have a thousand row houses and you have a standard thing that's like the power wall or you have a Schneider XW and a five kilowatt battery and three kW of solar and it's, it's custom fit, permitting is easy and fast and that type of thing, there is a place for it. It's just tough though when the cost per watt of residential storage is probably two fifty to three bucks and you can and now you're looking at a dollar a watt for you know the very large systems right now. But it can be done. Okay. Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to just quickly add uh, to that we are seeing um, for multifamily residential uh, buildings, uh, as far as meeting some of the, the common area loads and, and offsetting some of the demand charges that um, that the building owners are facing. This isn't for each individual apartment per se, but um, for the building as a whole, uh, are seeing applications where these are starting to be installed at the residential multifamily level. Right. The, the key to that would be that they're uh, being charged as a commercial customer, correct? Correct. Right. So they would have a demand charge and, and uh, uh, building-wide loads that, that would make it uh, make more sense. And that, that is an excellent uh, resilient power application as well because you often have a population that would be a lot better off being able to shelter in place <clears throat> during a, a power outage uh, that's caused by a natural disaster, for example, than having to evacuate. Uh, so uh, let me go on to the next question here. Um, somebody wants to know at what point you see battery replacing spinning reserves, or in other words, uh, at what point are battery will batteries be valued as as spinning reserve capacity? Anybody want to take that on? Well, I'll do it. I mean, it's <clears throat> as as a sole application, never. Um, as as a way to provide um, you know incremental value as part of a value stack, um, that can be done you know really with with uh, installations today in PJM. Um, the notion there is spinning reserve is, and again. One has to understand the markets and the interplay between the markets. So in PJM, for example, regulation and synchronous reserves can be bid simultaneously, but you can only play in one at a time. And thus, you know, one who is participating in these markets has to know because one of the disadvantages or one of the problems they're having with batteries in PJM right now is people go in and they bid zero. <laughs> and thus, sometimes they'll have 60, 70 percent of the regulation requirement for hour being provided by batteries, and that's you know that's that causes technical problems that uh, that Seth was talking about, and I think that his report you know gets into. Um, but if you do it in such a way that you are bidding into the spinning reserve market at a certain dollar threshold, because spinning reserve can vary between you know one cent to a couple hundred bucks. Uh, per megawatt, um, you know, you're going to, what we found in our analysis is that the, you can play above a threshold of about $15 a megawatt, about 10% of the hours um, in, in, in spinning reserve. 
And I think, you know, again, one thing that we have in terms of our uh, IP and our patents and IG is this notion of the value stack that says, you know, if it's better to play in spending reserve for that hour, because the market's much bigger than regulation, than it is to provide and play in FR for that hour, um, you know, we'll play in spending reserve. Um, there's just a question of making that choice and bidding in such a way that, you're, that we're going to get, you know, the most bang for the buck for that hour. So it, it, it's potentially possible now, but no one's doing it, and we intend to be, you know, at the forefront of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, somebody wants to know uh, regarding the customer savings slide. Uh, I guess that was your slide, Jay. Uh, what what size storage system is being modeled, and how much can peak demand be reduced by as a percentage of the storage system's nameplate capacity? So um, I'd have to go back to that slide, but I think I remember pretty well. That was based, I believe, on a 100 kilowatt system, which is, the, as Seth was saying, that's the PJM minimum. And the extent to which you can reduce, again, we're not using this in PJM for, you know, arbitrage or demand charge reduction. I mean, the peak load contribution um, is something where typically, you know, you, you, it's, it's one hour on one day. You don't know exactly when that hour is. You know that 95% of the time it's going to be between 3 o'clock and uh, 6 o'clock p.m. Um, and generally, it's at the 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock hour. So realistically, depending on how you time that battery for that system, um, you should be able to reduce the PLC by, we think, about 40% of the capacity of the battery, assuming a deep discharge during those capacity days, which means that if it's a 100-kilowatt system, we think uh, that you can reduce PLC by 40 kilowatt hours. Um, you know, and maybe, worst case, 33%, because you may not hit you know, all five or all ten of the magic hours, although, you know, we're obviously going to use it for that purpose um, more than five or ten days out of the year. You know, over the course of the summer, you're going to probably do it 20 times just to make sure you're covered. Um, but I would say that typically very safe bet is, you know, 33% of the uh, of the storage capacity of the battery is what you could reduce the PLC by with that application. Great. Uh, somebody wants to uh, know about energy storage as a uh, technology that can, ad can address the duck curve, which came out of uh, California ISO. Um, I think uh, the data was for 2013, and it's it was shown on one of our slides. It's, it's a very famous uh, curve at this point, and um, you know, it's a ramping issue, as I understand it, when solar uh, drops, uh, solar generation drops off after midday at the same time as uh, customer demand starts to starts to ramp up in the you know toward the evening peak. Um, all of a sudden, the the uh, you know sort of traditional fossil fuel generators all have to suddenly ramp up um, and so there's a ramping issue is that something you know, what to what degree can can storage address that and I guess more to the point of this webinar you know is there or will there be uh, some kind of ramping product that or market that could be uh, you could bid into um, or is it covered by an existing you know, market or product already. Well, I, I do know that there there is talk of developing ramping products. I'm not aware of any that are currently in place, but I know that California has been looking into it, and I think the Midcontinent ISO has also been looking into it. Um, another thing I'm saying about um, California in particular is that at um, a customer level, this might be addressed through the utilities, through dynamic pricing of rates, through like time of use pricing. So, if a customer is they have a, a large amount of customers on uh, with solar panels and they start to see more and more of the duck curve, they can shift the the peak rates towards a later and later time to when this large ramping um, 
Uh, so when, when the solar goes offline and this large ramp occurs, they can shift the peak away from, say, you know, noon hours or noon to three and shift it more towards the, say, three to eight o'clock. So that will send a pricing signal to, um, to homeowners or uh, businesses uh, that they may want to store some of that energy if they have a storage system to um, during the off-peak time when they're not using this much to be then released again later. It's this energy uh, time shift idea. So even if there's not a market mechanism, there can still be a utility rate mechanism that makes it economically viable to shift production or shift the discharge of the energy until a later time. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to want to speak to that? Nope, I think it was good answer. Okay, um, you know, I wanted to. You know, we keep talking about um, market signals, and I wanted to ask um, because this is something I've seen uh, illustrated with with graphs and charts that you know different markets, even the different. Uh, you know, going from, for example, ISO New England to PJM, if you look at the at the uh, signal that's actually generated, um, that the the storage system is is seeing that would in, you know tell it what what is required uh, in terms of uh, you know providing load or providing uh, you know releasing energy into the system. Those signals apparently vary quite a bit from from uh, from one region to another. So I was wondering if you guys could could maybe speak to the importance of you know what is the importance, for example, of of uh, MISO uh, look, looking at developing or implementing a fast signal, which I, I just saw the other day that they're doing. What's the signal speed or shape, you know, or, or design? got to do with the way that the, the storage system can be used. Well, this is Jay, um, and I'll, I'll speak to that even though right now we're focused really on, on PJM with, you know, looking to move into uh, additional markets. Uh, probably ERCOT will be next. It really depends on, on the maturity and, and where they are. MISO is probably right behind PJM in terms of creating a market for regulation. Um, the issue with MISO is that the value right now is probably about half of what it is in PJM, and so the question is whether the economics play. The reality with, with batteries, particularly the lithium-ion technology today, and the inverters and the uh, BMSs that they're attached to, is that they're very, they can respond very quickly. And the extent, um, it really comes down to uh, what is the sort of, you know, average depth of discharge um, that you're playing related to a signal because that has a profound impact on the type of, you know, chemistry and cell structure uh, and C factor that you have um, and the way you're going to respond to that signal. So, and, and that's because, you know, uh, battery chemistry, the physics are, are linear, in ter or not linear. It, it's not a linear relationship between depth of discharge and number of cycles. It's logarithmic. So an 80% depth of discharge a lithium-ion battery today will have a warranty of five to 10,000 cycles. If it's a 2.5% depth of discharge or 5% depth of discharge, you may be at a million to 5 million cycles. Um, it, it's vastly different. And, and thus, the construction of the signal and the mileage, if you will, uh, in terms of how that plays, has a significant impact in terms of how you want to structure uh, the response of a unit um, to the signal. And, and, and again, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but, it, but it's true. That's the advantage of a network aggregated approach um, to the signal as opposed to a single unit, you know, discrete element because the same battery that may uh, be sized and have the right C factor to respond to the signal of PJM may not be the same type of battery that on a, on a one-off basis you'd want to employ in New England ISO or MISO. Um, so that's a, that's a consideration that really needs to be done at the front end of the project 
but can be mitigated significantly by having that battery as part of a fleet um, where that asset, you know, can now take advantage of how it parses out that signal, that, that individual signal that comes from the control error to the various uh, assets in the fleet. Okay. Thanks very much. That kind of cues up another question from one of the listeners. Uh, the question is, will you see any deep discharge applications, i.e. flow battery technology, develop in the short term? Uh, i.e., are you seeing business cases for deep discharge applications which are not fast response? And I should maybe just explain to people that um, you know flow batteries are currently, uh, to my knowledge, being used in some uh, demonstration projects. They are they are out in the field and functioning. Uh, I don't believe that they're commonly available yet as a commercial product. Uh, we've done some previous webinars on flow batteries and uh, essentially uh, it sort of uh, takes apart the battery chemistry and separates it out into components so that you have two tanks of electrolytes that are then pumped into a power block and flow past a, a catalyst, and so um, it, it's a, it's a uh, way to separate the power and the energy functions of the battery. So if you wanted to, for example, increase the energy of the battery, you could uh, simply put in larger tanks. Um, so I, I, I hope that I'm you know, explaining that coherently. So. So what are you guys seeing? Are there business cases for uh, deep discharge applications rather than fast response types of technologies right now? Uh, I mean, I can kind of speak to this. I, uh, I know, again, it, it is the, the difference between the sort of the long duration um, use is really the, the – the area where the flow batteries are being being proposed and being used the most, and uh, I know I've, I've seen them more in applications where it's um, like an energy arbitrage. So uh, in places where you have a large wind farm and you don't want to discharge that uh, at a time when energy prices are low or, or cause negative energy prices, then a uh, flow battery can be used to hold that energy to be discharged at a later time and um, you can do it for a fairly large block of time in comparison to, say, a lithium-ion battery. Uh, it's also, you know, potentially a good application for um, for resiliency um, to provide power for a, for a longer period for, you know, grid-level resiliency applications. Um, and I've seen them employed for um, for places to, to avoid uh, um, some of the uh, transmission uh, congestion problems where, um, you need a block of energy for a certain amount of time to avoid um, high levels of, of transmission congestion. Uh, instead of putting, you know, uh, more generation into the system, the, they've used a, a flow battery for the application. Uh, Jay, do you have anything that, that you're seeing? No, I, I think you covered it. I mean, obviously, you know, synchronous reserve and, and capacity. Uh, the, the, the challenge, and, and obviously ramping once there is a monetization of that, I mean, the challenge with uh, energy-intensive applications is they tend to be more valuable. I mean, peak load contribution on a per kilowatt-hour basis is much more valuable to regulation. They're far less frequent, though. Uh, they're not 8760 markets. I, I think where you're going to really see that come to play is when you have enough installed intermittent capacity in wind or solar, and there is a value for ramping. Um, you know, flow batteries are well suited for that. One other obvious uh, application is in microgrids, but that's obviously the I think a, a topic for a future day. Okay, thanks very much. I want. I just want to say I I, I may have misspoken. I, uh, I, there are some flow batteries that are commercially available. I guess what I was what I was thinking, what I should have said was I, I don't, I haven't seen a whole bunch of uh, purely commercial applications as yet. I've seen I'm seeing kind of pilot projects and demonstration projects with flow batteries. I think they they have a lot of potential, um, and and they're they're sort of in the the phase where they they're proving that out at the at the moment. 
Um, so I apologize if I if I mischaracterize them. I think we have reached the end of our uh, time for the webinar, and I want to again thank our presenters uh, for some excellent discussion and presentations. Uh, we have contact information on the screen. If you want to send us an email, visit our webinar archive or our uh, website, sign up for our listserv. Um, as I mentioned before, this is an uh, introduction to our new report on these uh, energy service markets, but also a, a sort of a kickoff for a quarterly series of webinars will be beginning in September that will update everybody on the various markets, what the value of services are in those markets, uh, you know, what, which direction trends are going, whether there's upcoming legislation or regulatory reform that would uh, affect the various uh, markets. And uh, so that's starting in September. We hope you'll all come back for the, the first in that series of webinars. And um, we probably also have some other upcoming webinars. Samantha, did you want to announce any? Sure. Um, we have, as Ted said, a couple of upcoming webinars. One on September 9th, the topic is fuel cells for wastewater treatment plants. Um, and then we've got a few more that month. The next one uh, related to this topic would be the Energy Storage Market Updates webinar. Um, and I would visit our website, cisa.org uh, backslash webinars, for information on both the upcoming and the archived webinars. Okay, great. Thanks very much again to our presenters and to all the participants. And uh, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, uh, but we did the best we could. And this, uh, if you are looking to go back and, and look at a slide again or listen again to part of the webinar, again, it will be archived. Uh, generally, uh, we get those up the same day or the next day. And... Uh, Feel free to review the webinar, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody.